All right, well, we're very fortunate uh, to have the Honorable uh, Leon Panetta join us uh, virtually this morning. Uh, unbelievable service to our nation. He was the 18th White House Chief of Staff from 1994 to 1997, the Director of the Central Intelligence Agency, 2009 to 2011, the 23rd United States Secretary of Defense from 2011 to 2013. Again, what incredible service. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as uh, for our topic here today, uh, way back in 2012, Secretary Panetta predicted the threat of a cyber Pearl Harbor. He uh, helped shape U.S. short-term cyber strategy and then the long-term strategy, really getting at the seriousness of cyber defense uh, for our nation and was uh, you know, leading the way in that. As we all know, attacks can not only disrupt businesses and steal intellectual property, but they can take down electrical grids, financial systems, dis uh, disrupt logistic chains. And, and again, as we know, uh, uh, no doubt about it, we've been talking about our installations and uh, what, what it would do there. They're no longer in this safe, uh, separated from our, uh, those that would do us harm. They can have a huge impact. Uh, so uh, uh, Secretary Panetta, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it, and uh, we look forward to your ex expert thoughts. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you, thank you very much uh, for for the kind introduction, and uh, it's great uh, to be with uh, with all of you virtually. Uh, prefer to be in person, but uh, obviously, uh, you know, we've been through a few years where that's been become more difficult, and I've gotten used to doing Zoom after Zoom. So. Uh, I'm glad to at least have this opportunity to join you uh, virtually. Uh, also, uh, want to uh, commend my friend uh, Fred Muir, who I know uh, works a great deal with uh, the association. Uh, Fred and I have known each other for, I think, almost 50 years. Uh, he was the uh, chief engineer at Fort Ord when I was stationed there as an intelligence officer. Uh, as congressman, he was uh, a leader. Uh, with regards to uh, the uh, civilian military community trying to pull them together, uh, which is something I know the association is focusing on uh, as we speak, uh, the importance of that community partnership in order to sustain the installations that we have across the country. That's something uh, we know a lot about uh, with the uh, Defense Language Institute, as well as the Navy Postgraduate School. Uh, We've, uh, we've had our fights as well uh, in trying to make sure that the military understood the importance of those uh, installations. And uh, Fred also helped uh, in the BRAC process for Ford Ord, uh, which was, uh, as many of you know, uh, a very large base here in the Monterey area. Uh, we went through the BRAC process, we were able to establish a campus of the uh, California State University system uh, at Fort Ord. Uh, and I have to tell you, one of the people who was uh, very important to that effort was Fred, because there were a few people who really understood uh, the infrastructure that was on a military post, and he did. Uh, he knew where the water lines were, the electric lines. Uh, he knew the challenges with housing. Uh, so it's uh, fr Fred and I have had a very important partnership, and I just want to uh, pay tribute to him for uh, his patriotism and his dedication to duty. Uh, I'm honored to be with the association because uh, you're focusing on issues related to Army installations, and that's great. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm honored to have this opportunity. Uh, first of all, because the association, uh, which is a group that I've had tremendous respect for, uh, is very critical to installation support, uh, and it's critical to uh, the support for the Army as well. Uh, as a former U.S. officer in the Army, uh, I have to tell you that uh, my service in the military was extremely important to uh, my ability to be able to uh, provide service uh, in all of the jobs that I've had in Washington, uh, whether it was as a member of Congress, whether it was chief of staff, uh, CIA director, secretary, uh, that service in the military was extremely important to giving me uh, the values that I think are critical to those that provide duty to country. Uh, 
also as former Secretary of Defense, uh, I was very proud to lead uh, that department, the Defense Department, proud of all the services that are part of that uh, department. Uh, and uh, as you know, some of the toughest duties you have as Secretary uh, is uh, deploying our forces uh, into harm's way. And we had to do that every week, uh, looking at the various orders and deployments uh, and going over those, realizing that uh, I was putting uh, men and women in uniform uh, right in harm's way. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult challenge. Uh, and then in addition to that, doing the notes to the family of those whose loved ones were killed in battle uh, or killed uh, in the war areas. Uh, those, those are tough duties, uh, but uh, they made me truly respect uh, our men and women in uniform and the fact that they're willing to put their lives on the line in order to protect this country. Uh, and lastly, uh, a word about the U.S. Army. I, uh, as somebody who was an Army officer, I have uh, tremendous pride uh, in the Army. I had the chance to work with General Odierno, who was my chief of the Army, and uh, he was a great leader. Uh, we, we miss him a great deal. Uh, but I can't tell you how important he was to understanding that our Army had to be well-trained and well-supplied uh, and supported. And he was, he was willing to really be innovative in terms of making sure that the Army uh, could be deployed, uh, to, could help train, uh, and could work with other countries in developing their security. So uh, I really want to pay tribute uh, to, uh, to, to General Ogierno for the service he provided. Uh, you know, before I, I talk about cyber, it's, it's hard not to uh, kind of uh, look around and, and realize all of the crises uh, we've had to face over these last three years. Uh, these, are, these have been the years from hell, for, for God's sakes. Uh, not only uh, continuing to have uh, the COVID crisis, uh, which, uh, you know, we're, we're able to come out of, but uh, there's still uh, the variants that we're seeing. Uh, a million people, a million Americans have been killed uh, by that virus. Uh, the economic impact of that uh, costs a lot of jobs, costs businesses. Uh, and now we're facing uh, this very high inflation. Uh, over 8% uh, yesterday uh, was the news. Uh, and uh, it's at a 40 year high and clearly impacting uh, on people across the country. Uh, climate change here in California, we've had wildfires. We're now enduring a hundred year drought uh, that is uh, impacting uh, on our agriculture and on all of our communities throughout the state. And the polarization that we've seen in Washington, the deep divisions uh, that we've seen uh, that resulted, uh, frankly, in something I thought I would never see, which was an attack on the U.S. Capitol, uh, telling us how fragile our democracy is. And, and now a war in Europe. Uh, you know, I, I, never, I never believed in my lifetime uh, that I would see uh, another war in Europe. I, I was a kid in, during World War II. Uh, and uh, remember uh, what war was about at that time. And I, I never anticipated that another tyrant uh, would decide to invade uh, a, a sovereign, uh, independent, democratic country. Uh, it, it's incredible. We live in a dangerous world. That's the bottom line. We live in a dangerous world. And it requires strong U.S. leadership uh, in that world. Uh, I think, uh, I don't think there's any question, uh, you know, since World War II, how critical United States leadership has been to trying to uh, protect the peace in the world. Uh, and I know that uh, there were some who thought that, uh, you know, uh, because of globalization, uh, we were too, too stretched out. We should withdraw from our responsibilities. Uh, the kind of uh, argument for isolationism that we saw prior to World War II. Uh, but in the end, we understand that if the United States isn't providing that leadership, very frankly, nobody else will. Uh, and that uh, we've seen recently with the United States uh, recognizing that 
it is important to be a world leader and to work with our allies in confronting our adversaries uh, and the threats that we face in the world. Uh, I think it's, it's extremely important that the United States uh, and our NATO allies are as unified as they are uh, in trying to help uh, Ukraine. Uh, it is critical. Uh, Russia and Putin for too long uh, sensed weakness on the part of the United States. Uh, and he took advantage of it. He's a bully. That's, uh, you know, I, I, I dealt with Putin. Uh, he's a KGB agent. Uh, you never can forget that. Uh, and uh, he's somebody who will take advantage if he feels that somebody is weak. Uh, and uh, he, he felt that uh, he could get away with going into Georgia, going into the Crimea, going into Syria and Libya, uh, and conducting a bold cyber attack against the United States of America and our election systems. Uh, it, it is a very important strategy. It's a critical strategy uh, that if you're dealing with somebody like Putin, you have to draw a line. You have to operate from strength. Uh, I think that Putin, very frankly, even looking at, uh, you know, the early part of this administration, what happened in Afghanistan, the distrust of our allies, uh, really felt that he could get away with this invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and I think that uh, the United States and our allies did what is necessary. They drew a line uh, and they made clear that he would pay a price. Uh, and frankly, he has paid a price. Putin's paid a real price in Ukraine. Uh, he's paid a price in sanctions that have weakened his economy. He's paid a price because we provided weapons and training to the Ukrainians uh, and their ability to be courageous and brave on the battlefield has been incredibly important to uh, stopping the invasion. Uh, and we've reinforced NATO. A lot of our military forces uh, have reinforced NATO positions. And we've made clear that Article 5 will go into effect uh, if Putin tries to invade any of those countries. Uh, and uh, you, you, you have to pay a lot of tribute to, to the Ukrainians. Uh, you know, they, they really have fought well. I, as, as all of you know, I'd rather have warriors that really believe in their cause, believe in the importance of fighting for their country. Uh, I'll take that warrior anytime. And that's what Ukrainians are all about. They are fighting because they believe in their country and they believe in what's right. Uh, and, uh, you know, for that reason, they were able to stop the Russian invasion in what I call phase one of this last war. Uh, we went through phase two, which is the siege warfare and total destruction uh, that the Russians engaged in that uh, has been aimed at innocent men, women, and children trying to break the will of the Ukrainians. Uh, they weren't able to do that either. And so now we're in phase three where they're trying to regroup and reinforce uh, their position, uh, particularly in the Donbass area. And it is very critical right now that the United States and our allies continue to be unified and continue to provide the weapons that are necessary and essential to Ukrainians in order to be able to push back the Russians. This is a critical moment, probably the most critical phase in this war. Uh, and if they can keep pushing back on the Russians, uh, that is the the best way. Putin only understands force. If we can make clear to Putin that uh, he's engaged in a failing mission and that he is not going to win, and I honestly believe he's not going to win. Ukrainians are not going to let him win. Uh, ultimately, that's the best way to hopefully, at some point, end this, uh, this terrible war. Look, it's both dangerous and pivotal. Dangerous because uh, it can escalate in a number of ways. But it's very pivotal. What happens in Ukraine will tell us very a lot about what happens in the 21st century in terms of uh, the fate of democracies and the fate of alliances. Uh, so it's it's critical that uh, uh, that we stand tough on this issue. And ba basically, Frank, it's the same message uh, that we we need to send to China. It's the same message we need to send to North Korea and to Iran. Uh, and to terrorists around the world. Uh, why 
why is it dangerous in terms of escalation? We know that Putin uh, could resort to chemical gas uh, warfare. We know that he's talked about the possibility of low yield nuclear weapons. Uh, he's talked about the possibility of invading other NATO countries, but he's also talked about cyber uh, and uh, the use of cyber to basically uh, go after particularly the infrastructure in a country. Uh, cyber, as I've often said, is uh, without question the battlefield of the future, uh, and it just happens to be the battlefield of the present right now. Uh, just this morning in the New York Times, uh, there was an article that uh, Ukrainians have successfully fought back an effort uh, by Russian hackers uh, to take down uh, their electric grid. Uh, you know, an impact on uh, two, three million people uh, by doing that. But they were successful. Uh, we, we know that the Russians will use uh, cyber. Uh, they used it against our country and they'll use it against other countries. Uh, and uh, it, it only tells us how vulnerable we can be if we are not fully prepared to deal with that threat. Uh, it was mentioned uh, that 10 years ago, I gave a speech at the Intrepid uh, in New York Harbor, uh, in which I, I really wanted to make the American people aware of the threat of a cyber attack. Uh, and I said the following, uh, which I think is still applicable, uh, and I quote, it's the most, the most destructive scenarios involve cyber actors launching several attacks on our critical infrastructure at one time to disable and degrade critical military systems and communication um, methods and net networks. The collective result could be a cyber Pearl Harbor, an attack that causes physical destruction and the loss of life, unquote. Uh, the the fact is that a cyber attack could, could paralyze our country. Uh, that possibility is there. Uh, at the time, uh, bef a little bit before I gave that speech, uh, the Iranians had deployed a virus called the Shamoon virus. And they deployed it against uh, Aramco oil in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that sophisticated virus literally destroyed 30,000 computers. It basically shut down Aramco oil. Uh, it was the most destructive attack we had seen with the use of cyber. That same virus, that same kind of sophisticated virus, if applied uh, against our critical infrastructure, it could very well shut down our electric grid, our financial systems, our military systems, our transportation systems, our water systems, our energy systems, our government systems, uh, because all of, all of our infrastructure is dependent on computers. That's a reality. Uh, and the ability to shut down those computers can paralyze and shock our nation. Today, we, we've seen cyber attacks increase dramatically. Uh, not only against uh, businesses with the deni denial of service, uh, we've also seen them steal vital information uh, using hacking. Uh, they've also gone after infrastructure, and they certainly have gone after our election systems. Uh, we saw what happened with colonial pipeline attack, where hackers from Russia were able to shut down a vital oil pipeline that supplied fuel to the, to the East Coast. Uh, in addition to that, uh, they attacked uh, JBS meat packers and shut down a meat packing operation, which impacted on their ability to supply food to, uh, to the American people. Uh, ransom attacks. Ransom attacks now are happening, as I understand it, almost every 11 seconds. And last year it cost, in ransom paid, $6.7 trillion. $6.7 trillion. 
were paid in, because of ransom attacks. And they continue as we speak. And as I said, uh, we know that our election systems remain vulnerable to those kinds of attacks. We saw what happened in 2016. The Russians used the same efforts in 2018 and 2020. Uh, and it can be anticipated that they'll use the same capabilities in 2022. While the Department of Homeland Security has the lead over cybersecurity, along with the uh, FBI intelligence agencies, State Department, uh, and some other departments that have a role to play, DOD has a role as well when it comes to protecting our country from cyber attacks. Uh, the mission of the Department of Defense is to defend the nation. Uh, and because these cyber attacks can attack our vital infrastructure, can result in killing people and certainly destroying an important part of our country, uh, I consider that uh, an act of war. And for that reason, it is very important for the Department of Defense to have a vital role in the ability to protect our country. Uh, what, what needs to happen here in order to make sure that we can protect our country against the potential of these cyber attacks? Number one, it is very important that we continue to develop new capabilities. We've got to stay on the cutting edge of technology. Uh, I sit on the board of Oracle and Silicon Valley. I've seen uh, the innovation and creativity uh, in Silicon Valley and how quickly technology changes, particularly with artificial intelligence, robotics, and all the other areas that are currently being developed. Cyber and the ability to use new technologies with regards to cyber is a real threat. We've got to stay ahead of the curve. We've got to stay on the cutting edge of technology. We also need to make sure we have skilled cyber warriors. People understand what's going on in the cyber arena. Not easy. A lot of people are being recruited uh, who have some cyber capabilities. They're being picked up by private businesses across this country. Uh, but the U.S. military, the U.S. Depart Defense Department has to be able to get some of these bright young people who are who understand cyber, uh, we've got to be able to have the best and the brightest as part of our force. We need to develop the finest cyber force and operations in the world because it is a threat and it's something we need to be prepared to deal with. Uh, obviously, the, de the department uh, is involved in trying to provide cyber defenses right now. Uh, literally, when I walked into the Defense Department, there were millions of attacks every day that were trying to penetrate the Defense Department. Uh, and it is a constant challenge to be able to make sure that we're protecting our vital information systems from these kinds of cyber attacks. We not only need a strong cyber defense, but frankly, we also need a strong cyber offense. The ability to uh, develop the kind of forensics that can address uh, where the source of the problem is so that we can identify who is attacking us and then go after those attackers. We need to have the capacity to locate and to go after those who are responsible for cyber attacks. The second uh, important step is one that really does require something that we've had a hard time pulling together, which is a comprehensive national strategy dealing with cyber. Uh, you know, the, the defense industries, uh, the defense department uh, are pretty good uh, with regards to dealing with cyber, and so is intelligence, so is the CIA. But a lot of departments and agencies really don't have the abilities and the capabilities that they should have in order to protect against cyber attacks. We need to ensure that there is a comprehensive national strategy that develops the policies and organizations uh, and requirements that need to be taken across the federal government. 
Uh, when I was uh, at CIA, I remember there was an effort by uh, the Homeland Security Department at that time to try to better coordinate uh, these areas. Uh, but frankly, it didn't come together very well. Uh, it, 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 you know, there, there's there's this danger of stovepiping that everybody has in Washington. Uh, and if you're if you're not working together, if we're not developing a, a nationwide approach to dealing with cyber, uh, frankly, a stovepipe approach to cyber is going to fail. Uh, there'll be some departments who do well. There'll be others that will fail. So it's really important to try to develop those commands that are involved with cyber and to develop greater coordination uh, and requirements. I know that the Biden administration is trying to uh, develop uh, that kind of coordination. I think it's extremely important. Uh, you've got to have DHS, you've got to have the FBI, Justice, DOD, others all working together if we're going to have effective efforts to protect this country against a cyber attack. And the last point I want to make is that we need stronger partnerships. Uh, we've got to have a strong partnership between the public and private sector. Uh, businesses are getting attacked uh, every day, as I said, uh, with ransom attacks. We need to have and share that information. Uh, what are the kind of viruses that are being used? What, what kind of attacks are being used? Uh, everybody is kind of playing their own game. The private sector is going out and getting uh, their own methods, obviously, of providing cybersecurity. They don't share a lot. They're paying ransoms, which I think is the worst thing you can do uh, with, with uh, regards to uh, these kind of attacks. But I also understand they, you know, they, they, they're worried about sharing that kind of information. They're worried about the business impact. But we need to have a stronger partnership between the public and private sector. We've got to be working together we all share global infrastructure, uh, and we all share the responsibility, frankly, to protect it. Uh, we've got to be able to work with the business community and develop trust in the business community so that they will work with us to establish standards for our critical infrastructure, for our power plants, for our gas pipelines, for our water treatment facilities, we've got to be able to make sure that we are defending this country in every aspect against the potential of a cyber Pearl Harbor. Uh, and I think for, for all of you that are talking about partnerships with communities, I think it is important for you to develop a partnership with the communities that are part of our military installations so that they too recognize the importance of providing cyber uh, protection. Uh, it's, it's an area that we need to develop the kind of partnership we're developing in so many other ways with our communities across this country. I think cyber ought to be one of those targets as well. Uh, let, me, uh, let me conclude with uh, talking about why this is important. Uh, you know, as all of you know, I was involved in the operation to go after bin Laden. It was a successful operation. And, and I really felt that that mission was conducted on behalf of the victims and families of 9-11. The reality is that before 9-11, there were warning signs about what would happen that we didn't pay attention to. We weren't organized, we weren't ready, and as a result, we suffered terribly because of the lack of attention, the lack of preparation, the lack of coordination, the lack of sharing vital information. We can't let that happen again. Uh, this is in some ways a pre-9-11 moment when it comes to cyber. Attackers are plotting every day. Attackers are doing everything they can to try to undermine our capabilities, and particularly our adversaries, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, all are developing sophisticated cyber capabilities. So they're plotting. 
our systems can be penetrated and we've got to do a much better job at protecting them. Uh, as we know, uh, Russia is, is probably at the top of the list. Uh, they're using cyber and they're going to use cyber, uh, I think, as a new phase, frankly, of the war in Ukraine. Uh, that we're already seeing that, that they're going to resort to greater cyber attacks. We've got to be ready for that. We've got to be prepared to fight back. Uh, as some of you know, I'm the son of uh, Italian immigrants. Uh, and I used to ask my parents why they came all of that distance to come to this country. And I never forgot my father's answer when I asked him why he did it. Why did he come all of that distance to come to a strange land? He said, because my mother and he believed they could give their children a better life. Frankly, that's the American dream. That's the dream we want for our children and for their children, to be able to provide a better life through by providing better security uh, for them and for this country. Uh, we've, we've achieved the American dream because we've been willing and able to defend our interests and our values around the world. And that is the most important mission that we have, whether it's on land, on sea, in the air, in space, and yes, in cyberspace as well. It's not just a responsibility. It is a duty we owe our children in order to make sure that we protect the American dream. Thanks for having me. presentation. Uh, you've given this group a lot to think about today and discuss. If you have a minute or two, we have a few uh, a few target a few good questions for you if you have sure. just a few more minutes. Great. Mr. Secretary, how are you? So Lucia yeah. Niemeyer, uh, former Secretary of Defense, uh, former SAS staffer when you were Secretary of Defense, and most importantly, also the son of an Italian immigrant. Um, <laughs> So right now I'm running a nonprofit called Building Cybersecurity, and we're really trying to get after what you mentioned is the threat to human life uh, from a cyber attack, particularly to operational technologies. Uh, one of the things I would love to get your suggestions on or your views on, what's scaring the crap out of me personally is what's happening not just between nation states, but with third-party actors uh, going after nation states. President Biden has had a very measured and deliberate response um, in trying to avoid escalation. But we've got outside groups that are actively attacking Russian assets um, without necessarily any kind of accountability. What's your view on that? Because for me, it's keeping me up at night. What's your view? How do we manage these third party actors when we, when we are engaged in a very sensitive um, um, battle, for lack of a better word, on trying to, 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 be, to be careful not to escalate? Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. And I worry about the same thing. Uh, you know, the, the problem is that. Uh, uh, Everybody these days is a hacker uh, in terms of uh, using computers and they're all over the place. And uh, uh, there are individuals that uh, are conducting these kind of attacks on their own. Uh, we've seen crim criminal operations make use of it. Uh, although I think the ones in Russia probably uh, are operating an awful lot at the direction of the Russian intelligence agencies. Uh, but what I've seen happen in these last uh, number of months is that there are a lot of people that are kind of taking uh, taking responsibility for going after uh, various targets uh, using cyber. And you know, I on you know on, on the one hand, I, I understand the importance of being able to uh, to fight back. Uh, but as always, and I think we all know this, it is a hell of a lot better if people are working together on a coordinated plan as to uh, what those targets are and how we ought to be going after them. Uh, I think that part of the responsibility here for the administration 
is to truly try to reach out uh, and make clear that uh, there has to be a coordinated effort here, particularly with regards to Ukraine uh, and the Russians. Because uh, there's no question, as I said, there's a danger of escalation. Uh, if one of these uh, people, uh, you know, targets uh, something that is vital, uh, it could clearly escalate uh, the conflict uh, in a dramatic way. Uh, so I, I really think that there's not only a requirement here to develop that partnership between the public and private sector. I think there has to be an effort to develop a partnership between uh, the public uh, sector and our people, and our people who are who are operating uh, these kind of uh, private hacker uh, efforts. Uh, it's not. E I mean, it's easier said than done. Obviously, as you know, uh, this is a complicated process. But I think we have the forensics to be able to determine where these hackers are operating from and who they are. Uh, and I, fr frankly, I think it's probably a good thing that uh, they understand that, that what they are doing, while I'm sure they believe it's important, uh, what they are doing is operating uh, on their own at a time when we have to we have to be able to strategize and develop what is our approach going to be uh, in confronting the Russians, in confronting the Chinese, in confronting North Korea and Iran. Uh, and you know, I, I, I use the example when I was at the CIA that we developed a very close relationship with the Israelis. Uh, they had very good capabilities. Uh, and we were working together to uh, focus on targets that we could both work on. And it really paid off. It really paid off because we were coordinating and because we were working together. We can be much more effective if we can coordinate what are the targets that we want to go after and who should uh, uh, conduct those particular attacks. Uh, I know I'm asking an awful lot. Uh, this is a world in which everybody wants to do their own thing. Uh, and I understand that. But I think, I think there really is a responsibility here uh, to reach out and try to make sure that we are better coordinating those efforts in order to make sure that when it comes to a cyber attack, we are, we, are, we are being responsible in what we're targeting and we're making damn sure that uh, we're able to go after effectively the targets that we identify. So you've, you've, uh, you've made a very important point. I hope that uh, the administration pays attention to that area. Sir, this is uh, Fred. A, a question on organization. Um, when you talked about the the pursuit of bin Laden, uh, you sort of restructured within the CIA in terms of how that effort was, I'll call it unified. What would be your your suggestion recommendations to how do we get that all of government effort unified to really imagine the unimaginable that will happen when that that long term outage happens? We saw what happened in New Orleans after a few days. Of, of outage and the social unrest. If, if we start imagining what could happen, um, it's not pretty. So how do you suggest we think about, uh, I'll call it energizing a whole government effort to start addressing that? Uh, it's an easy question, I realize, so. <laughs> um, Fred, you know, the one thing uh, I've learned uh, in all of my, all of my experience uh, in the different jobs that I've been in, uh, whether it was uh, whether it was in Congress or the administration, uh, whatever department uh, or agency I was in charge of, that uh, the only way you get things done is by kicking ass. Uh, and you know, if you're, if you're not if you're not willing to get tough uh, and make sure that people are doing the job that they're assigned, uh, nothing gets done. Nothing gets done. 
Uh, and I think for a long time, when it comes to cyber, you know, everybody was kind of doing their own thing. And frankly, even the American people kind of take, take cyber for granted. Everybody's got an internet, everybody's uh, on their computer, everybody's doing their own thing. Uh, they're revealing all of the secrets of their lives on, uh, on the computer. Uh, and uh, and they, they really do, don't worry that much about uh, the damage that can be done, uh, you know, from, from a cyber attack. And so there's a, I think there's a, a lack of awareness in terms of the American people as to how dangerous this stuff can be. I know they read about cyber attacks. I know they read about the kinds of things that can happen. But uh, as you know, it, unless it affects them directly, uh, they're not going to think an awful lot about uh, what needs to be done. I, I really think that the White House uh, has to have somebody in charge of cyber uh, who has the authority from the president to be able to say to the different agencies and departments that uh, we, we are going to you're going to work together. We're going to coordinate these efforts uh, in some kind of console that uh, can operate uh, over cyber. Uh, it, you know, I'm, I'm a believer that the best way to get things done is to put people in a room, put them around a table uh, and make sure that they're all in the same message. They all understand uh, the challenge. They all understand the threat. And they also all understand the strategy for dealing with that threat. Uh, and very frankly, those are the places where you, you can actually share the kind of experiences that need to be shared in order to determine what steps need to be taken. Uh, I think there's always been a hope that somehow this stuff would come together on its own. And it's not going to happen. It, you know, there's too much bureaucracy that interferes with the ability to be able to pull these efforts together. It's going to take a tough SOB who is willing to sit down, require that people sit down uh, at the White House and that the effort on cyber protection and cyber offensive is coordinated. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you know, Fred, uh, better than anybody, uh, the, the ability to get things done is based on human relationships. It's based on people. It's based on the quality of people. It's not you know, putting boxes on a on a paper uh, that kind of define the chain of command, et cetera, et cetera. I understand all of that. But the fact is that it is the quality of individual, the quality of leadership that ultimately defines whether you're able to get the job done. So you need to have somebody who has that leadership, who has the support of the president, the backing of the president, who's able to pull these agencies and departments together so that they are, they know that they do have to coordinate uh, with regards to cyber protection, uh, both defensive and offensive steps. That, that's a requirement because otherwise I think, you know, we're, we're just going to, we're going to operate by crisis. <laughs> crisis, if in the absence of leadership, uh, you know, I often tell the students here, as you know, we, we govern in a democracy either through leadership or crisis. Uh, if leadership is there and willing to take the risks associated with leadership, and mark my words, all of you know this, if you're going to be a leader, you're going to have to take risks. Uh, and if you're willing to do that, you can avoid or certainly contain crisis. But if you aren't willing to provide that leadership, then we'll operate by crisis. And uh, that's, it's a lousy way to govern, frankly, uh, to wait for each crisis and then respond to it. But right now, I think that's largely what we're doing. Sir, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate your support of this important event, your support of the Association of the United States Army, and most importantly, your tremendous service to our country. Please help me give Sec Secretary Panetta a round. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.